All right, welcome everyone. Uh, let's take a looking at the uh, um, attendees here. It uh, it looks like we do not have any newcomers to the group, but if there are any new people, go ahead and raise your hand or shout out. Uh, we have a pretty packed agenda today, so uh, I'm gonna dive in if if that's okay. Um, uh, just a real quick update on on Cyclone DX. Um, we've got uh, 1.6. This is the last remaining things that are going into 1.6. So after the after today, uh, the uh, the the specification will be frozen, and the only changes to it will be uh, will be documentation. Um, so, uh, but other than that, we are pretty solid in terms of um, um, a release. So uh, we can expect a release from OWASP here in the next probably couple of weeks. We're working, we're working on the paperwork at this point, which is press release and, and that sort of thing. Um, with that, um, let's, first of all, was there any questions on the Cyclone DX update before we go into the, the promotion? Looks good. All right, all right, Matt. I've got uh, I've got you up first. You want to uh, take it over? Yes, please. So uh, I have visual aids, but I won't slow us down. But if you recall, last call we talked through a pull request, um, and it's it's here. And at the time, I submitted and showed to you in uh, uh, graphical form a high level design and also the details of the JSON schema for environmental concerns for ML models uh, to refresh people's memories. Uh, it's a, uh, if you, I actually have some videos if you want, timely videos of papers and videos of people saying that uh, AI is going to, you know, take up, is currently taking up 1% of the world energies and, and it could consume more and more each year as it picks off the way we want it to. And so this is a big thing. And if you go to Hugging Face and a lot of model distribution points, they're now publishing proactively uh, energy usage, CO2 equivalents, things like things like that. And I and I showed how we want to capture this in, in our schema as part of the model card considerations alongside ethical considerations. Um, and I wanted to thank Jan because we met last Thursday and went through uh, comments that he had made. And then we worked diligently with Jan by my side when I ran into hiccups with some of the CI tests, but we got the ex equivalent XSD version created and the proto rough version created. And there's a, you can look in the pull request, there's a checklist of, of those things. Plus we added uh, test cases for each of the formats. So, and then we also hashed out um, actually expanding, uh, we expanded some of the data sets. We added some properties and some external references to make it extensible in the future. And we also uh, took the postal address that we had created and added it to organizational uh, entity and made it much more powerful. So, so uh, the energy provider now has a complete organizational ent entity with all the things that we're familiar with from, from that, uh, that structure, that object, um, alongside this new postal address, which gives us the concrete location, uh, you know, of the data centers and places where we get power from. So, and the, these are things that people are excited about because people said we'd like to reuse this in the future. But uh, Jan kindly um, created an issue, a future issue for 1.7, where we can discuss how we can re reuse some of these this provider concept uh, in other places in the future. And that's that's the net of it, if you will. Uh, any questions? All right. Is there anything that you wanted to share, or do you want me to just go into the documentation that we've um, uh, that you created? I mean, because uh, that's really what we're looking at with the, the documentation. It, I mean, I mean, I think I I did spend some time to create a, a visual aid, and we okay. can I'll throw it up there. You want to go ahead and share that? Yeah, trying to figure out how to share here. Share screen. Gotcha. All right. Pardon my cluttered desktop because I'm on a single laptop screen. Um, what I did was, let's see, I need to get to my browser. There we go. So I want you to look at the browser, not all the windows behind, so I'll make it bigger. 
And what I what I love to do, and I may have showed this last last meeting, is I, have a JSON, I often use a JSON schema viewer to visualize for people what's going on. So, in terms of, you can see the model card here at this node on the on the left under component. Any component, uh, component can declare itself to be a machine learning model as a type. And then if you have that, you should have a model card, obviously. And you can see that within the model card, there's a concept called considerations for why you would use or not use the model, uh, including use cases, technical limitations, performance trade-offs, ethical considerations, and, you can see, and fairness assessments. And you can see environment considerations, that's the new area that was added by this new schema in this pull request. And uh, environment, and we, we looked at a future where there might be other environment considerations. We created a, a top level structure. And then within it, we have a array of energy consumption. So the concept, uh, if you recall from last meeting, I threw together this slide, we, we, th there's uh, ever growing concern that the granularity and places we wanna capture, capture where, where, where energy is used uh, and equivalent CO2 is produced into the environment. Uh, it might be through the entire life cycle of uh, of the of the model, uh, but right now, principally, it's in the the um, the the everything's grouped grouped together as training, uh, and then there's also a, a new concept on the forefront of inference on a per inference request, and I think that there is a video I saw that to make one of those cool pictures, you go to a an a a model that generates a picture of some crazy thing mixed with some other crazy thing. That can take as much as a a full charge of a of your nice mobile uh, your uh, smartphone. So increasingly, you know, inference costs want to be considered as as well. Um, so we we created a system where we could expand and create a granular accounting for different energy consumptions at different points in the model life cycle. Um, so that's what we did. And then within each each activity uh, in the life cycle, you provide basically a description of where you got your where you're getting your energy from, who's your data pro, uh, energy source, your energy provider, and energy sources are based upon uh, a a um, multiple sources of U.S. energy and international energy sources. So it includes all the major categories, and we created an enum of all the considerations from coal to oil to we added bio, I added biofuels, and missing one from the last time. And then, of course, I mentioned the um, we added the address to the organizational entity you see on the, on the far right uh, under organization. So uh, that's everything. So you see the activity cost, so per activity energy cost, um, and you see the CO2 equivalent costs, and then you see the offset. So again, Hugging Face and uh, uh, other think companies are very proud in, in saying that they've offset for this for the training energy costs. Uh, and then we can always add details in the future. Where where is it offset? Do we really trust you? <laughs> or you know, where is that forest at? So, anyways, so these are things we can grow in the future, and that's all I have. Very cool. Um, can I just throw in a question, Matt? Um, this is this is amazing. Um, and you just mentioned some companies that say Hugging Face are are proud to mention their offset, etc. Um, are there any existing regulations in that space? that you should have a field for, like, I don't know, regulation one, two, three compliant, binary yes, no, um, is that a thing? I unfortunately don't know much about it. I'm just thinking of use yeah. cases. Yeah, so all of my reading is that there is, there is no, there are no requirements as of yet. So I think that, I think that this is more of a capitalistic thing where companies are competing saying my model is more efficient than your model use mine instead, right? So it's, it's a more of a competitive thing. And yeah. I brought up, so the, so if you look at the examples in my pull request, I use the Llama 2 model from Hugging Face to show how it would be uh, put into this, into an, the, the, S, the S bomb, if you will. Yeah. And if you scroll down here, you can see, um, you know, how they say for Llama 2 and for the different uh, 7 billion parameters versus whatever, how much CO2 was emitted and how much power was consumed. And uh, things like that. So, uh, and then the, so th th these are comparisons. So these are invited comparisons for comp competitive needs. And this is, and I'll be frank. This is where IBM tends to compete. We want to tell you that we can take a large model like Llama two, and we have ways to 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 break it down to a, a smaller model for a given task. So it uses less 
energy on a per inference basis. <clears throat> so those things are you'll see an increasing way, I believe. Right. It's probably very interesting to infer pricing models for your products, et cetera. That, that makes a ton of sense. Um, but I think those use cases yeah. will probably find themselves uh, as, as the need occurs. Yeah, cool. yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, it's like, you know, right now people are offering these services for free, but, you know, there's a cost and yeah. you know, eventually people are going to pay for that. And, you know, people are, people are going to speak up and say, hey, you know, why is my, why is my power grid going down in Texas as it often does? <laughs> because we got, we got this Azure data center in San Antonio that's drawing too much power from generating, you know, animations or something. I don't know. <laughs> Ian? Yeah, I, uh, no, it looks great. Um, I, I'm kind of curious, have you talked to uh, Daniel Bernstein over at Manifest at all about this and kind of gotten his thoughts? Yeah, we've been talking with Daniel. Um, have we talked to him about this particular feature, Matt? Uh, not directly, no. Okay. I think just for um, just for visibility, since he is, you know, he's, he's, he's really pushing AI bombs across the board. Um, having him aware of this capability would probably be good and getting some feedback from him. Um, yeah. Just because I know he's talking a lot with MITRE and other folks right now. This yeah. is Daniel who? <sighs> Uh, I can give you, I'll put his email address to the chat here. Yeah, he, he's it, the CTO it, of uh, Manifest Cyber. He does a lot of SBOM work. Yeah, so, so Daniel and I spoke at length twice on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, and, 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 but I haven't talked to him subsequent to this PR being submitted. I'll just say that. Okay. But I think and my belief is that the, the value will be, you know, he's, he hasn't, he's working on an Air Force contract. I believe that's his major contract for his company. And uh, I believe he can take advantage of this information readily. I think we've given extensibility points, but I think we're everything I'm representing is 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 been surveyed across many different places. Um, you know, both, both proactively being created by Google and Amazon and all the major model providers. And I think it'll do well for 1.6, and it's extensible enough now. And we can always add to it from 1.7. That at least that's my belief system. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily hold hold it up. To go talk to him. I think it's more that, uh, as, as I'll say, one of the influencers in the space, right? I think having <laughs> his his uh, input and kind of his sense of buy-in on it would help either propel it or could detract from its adoption. Oh yeah, I, I definitely want to circle back, and I want him to use this absolutely one hundred percent and provide feedback. Then I can use then I then I'm actually inviting comparison from my own company because. One of the big, you know, you know, IBM is not making these large models by itself, and we're looking to, you know, we're looking at the, through the AI alliance to form partnerships with Meta and others. Um, but our goal is to, again, like I said earlier, to compete on, you know, you know on abilities to crowdsource the training of models, as well as um, show the governance, both security and compliance governance that are at, at the ethical information that we store and the this energy information we store, you know, we're able to to fine tune models and, and reduce energy footprints and reduce uh, concern, ethical concerns for different consumers for different spaces. Yeah, ServiceNow is part of that AI alliance too, and we're going to be uh, dog fooding this, I guess you could say. And, my, and the, the projected hope is if this is 1.6, then we're gonna start publishing using this format uh, all the AI models that where we intend to publish them, and we'll try to push Hugging Face to use this format as well, because Hugging Face is part of the AI alliance as well. Yeah. All right. Very good, Matt. Um, does anyone have any uh, blocking objections to including this uh, capability into one point six? All right, I hear none. And I, before I leave, I want to give Jan one more tip of my hat for, for all of his help with me, especially with around the protobuf oh, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no objection. Since no one speaks up, I will do. Um, uh, also, at this point, I wanted to mention on our end, um, Dan Ehrenberg usually joins these conversations and he's hindered today. So I'm just going to be more uh, direct saying yes and no to things. Um, and uh, hoping to make sure that we make this like, I guess, a community effort. Um, I know uh, Matt and Jan, you worked on this together. So 
probably self-fulfilling prophecy if you say yes to this. Um, so I'm going to clearly say, like, I think this is cool. Go ahead. All right. Very good. Um, let's see. Where's my screen sharing? Uh, okay. So that was this one right here, which is, um, oh, I forgot to promote. All right, so there's that one, Matt, for you. Thank you. Um, very much. Yep. Thanks, Jan. Appreciate all the all the hard work you guys put into this. This was really amazing. Um, let's see. Next up on the agenda is license acknowledgments, which are either declared or concluded. Uh, previously, Cyclone DX basically just had um, licenses, and we weren't saying whether or not they were declared licenses, meaning, um, hey, this is the intent of the developer, right? Hey, I, I intend to make this available on, for example, versus the concluded license, which is um, what you typically do when you analyze a, a given piece of source code. And then uh, based on all the other licenses that might be present in the software, that is the that is the concluded license. So in some cases, it might differ. In a lot of cases, they're going to be the same. Um, so we added the, that support of uh, the, let's see, where's the, here's the license acknowledgement enumeration. Uh, so this is the definition that we came up with for that. Uh, declared licenses and concluded licenses represent two different stages of the licensing process within software development. Declared license refer to the initial intention of the software authors regarding the licensing terms under which their code is released. On the other hand, concluded licenses are the result of a comprehensive analysis of the project's code base to identify and confirm the actual licenses that the components used, which may differ from the initially declared licenses. While declared licenses provide an upfront indication of the licensing intentions, Included licenses offer a more thorough understanding of the actual licensing within a project, facilitating proper compliance and risk mitigation. Observed licenses are defined in uh, the evidence slash licenses section of the spec. Uh, observed licenses form the evidence necessary to substantiate included licenses. So in Cyclone DX, we, we put this in, in two different places. We extended the existing licensing support uh, for declared and concluded. And then that can also be then substantiated in our existing evidence uh, part of the spec uh, for the observed licenses. Uh, so we're going one step further, I believe, than, uh, than I think SPDX does. Uh, SCA vendors typically have these three categories of things to observe, declared, um, and uh, concluded. Um, I believe sonotype actually refers to the, to the concluded as effective. So declared, effective, observed. Um, any questions on this? This is a small change. Are you able to have more than one concluded license or is it is it just one concluded license and one declared license? It's one concluded license, although that concluded license could be an SPDX expression, which could contain multiple licenses. Okay. Um, you were just speaking of three categories, observed, declared, and concluded. Um, mm -hmm. I understood that the observed licenses were just under the evidence category, where mm -hmm. we put all the, the things that we can substantiate, as you said, with, with evidences, of course. Which means, of course, we observed it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have those evidences right. in the first place. So we are just using two categories to make sure that correct we have all the capabilities. Okay, I understood. Yep. Yeah, it's just the two categories. These are the enums. So it's either declared or concluded. And then the observed licenses are, are within the evidence. Uh, 
any other questions on this one? I guess my question would be um, if you're um, observing a license or if, if, if they mismatch the declared license and the observed license, which one counts? Like which one is legally binding? Concluded. Concluded. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, if you look at, you know, a typical build system, right? Um, if you are putting the licensing in an SBOM uh, from, I don't know, the Maven plugin or NPM plugin or something like that as you're building software, those are all declared licenses. Right. Typically what you need then need to do with is, is then use specialized tools. There's some open source tools, but most of them are commercial uh, that then come up with the concluded licenses. Right. And yep. it's going to, those, that type of software is going to look for incompatibilities or, you know, the cases where multiple licenses might have to be accepted, that sort of thing. And, and that will be your concluded licenses. And that's what the legal teams really care about. Understood. Sounds good. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any objections to uh, Matt? <laughs> Oh, sorry, no, I, I don't want to slow you down, but I just wanted to, to reinforce the fact I just had a conversation yesterday. This is like the most talked about conversation in IBM because we run any number of SCA tools. And even after they conclude the license, that's not our concluded license because our lawyers got to review it. And sometimes there's, and our system of record, ironically, now is ServiceNow. <laughs> so, so yeah, but we, we talked about how do we extract that information after all the lawyers can make their conclusions and put it back in the bomb. So it's right. very important. Yeah, understood. All right, any objections to uh, to, to this going into 1.6? I got a thumbs up from Jan. All right. Then we will mark this as... Um, Let's see, this is promoted, reviewed, and now accepted. Okay, um, redaction. This is an interesting, um, this is interesting. Um, this is something that has come up uh, occasionally during the NTIA and CISA um, working groups. Uh, there are times, and I've used I used to work for a software company. I don't currently uh, that 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 did have this requirement, um, but there are times where you cannot disclose under any circumstances what component you are using because that piece of software is used in pretty sensitive national security type of use cases. Um, so there is a requirement on some software vendors to um, omit, redact, if you will, uh, redact a certain, a certain information from a component. You can say that the component is there, can't tell you what it is. Uh, that's really what this use case is about. Um, it's providing as much transparency as possible. Um, while also acknowledging the fact that or some organizations have contractual or other kind of requirements that actually prevent them from disclosing. Um, so what we did here is, um, well, this, this change doesn't really reflect that too much, um, but we made some minor documentation changes here, but we basically added uh, a new enum value for this, just redacted. So right now we can specify, hey, this component or this assembly or this dependency relationship is uh, complete, uh, it's incomplete, uh, maybe it's, it's only the first party or maybe only the third party stuff, uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's some commercial thing that we just don't know what's inside this piece of software. Or this new case is, well, I know what the software is, I'm just not gonna tell you because I can't. Um, so that's this, that's this new use case. So with that, I will pause. Any questions? Uh, Steve, so I'm looking at the 1.5 stack. Where would this be? Is it under? Under compositions. Okay. Yeah. 
is there is there a way to also attest the absence of vulnerability in that undisclosed piece of software? There could be, yeah, you could do that. Um, so with the vulnerability, um, so with compositions, you can actually say that my vulnerability information is complete. And if you're including that redacted component, then that means that there's no vulnerabilities in that redacted component. Yeah. Um, so that's that's possible today. Uh, in addition, you can also use annotations to describe the fact that you're, this component does not have any risk. So there's there's multiple ways that you can communicate that today. Right, communicate, but not necessarily binding, right? So you, it's not right. necessarily um, cryptographically enforced, anything like that. Right. Um, that, would, right. that would be interesting. I mean, it's completely out of scope for the standard <laughs> spec, I guess. But uh, yeah, interesting. I, I like that field. Seems to be useful. Now, you can sign this. So if you apply a digital signature to that, then yeah, it, depending on contracts and that sort of thing, it theoretically could be legally binding, but by default, it's not. Yep. Understood. Makes sense. Thank you. Yep. See, I think my only big concern here is just in terms of like CISA hasn't really formulated like with their, their and again, it's not CISA per se, it's the SPL works for you. So I'm not going to even claim it's CISA. I think that's the wrong phrase. Um, but it's still very much like a topic of discussion. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that this issue is like, is like, you know, a week old. So it's fairly fresh. I don't know if there's been enough, I'll say, community input on this. Um, and if it's something that's adopted, then um, we may find ourselves um, misaligned with what CISA kind of proposes. So I, I'll give you the example, like I, I kind of threw out in those SBOM work streams. It's like, well, you can redact properties and names and versions, stuff like that, but ultimately you still should have a SHA for the component. There's some way to identify the component that's being redacted. Um, and so like figuring out like, there might be other things like that that get introduced. Like how does that work with this change? And do we find ourselves patching on additional stuff down the road and then, you know, yeah. just, versus waiting a little bit longer? Um, to, to get this in. That's a, that's a good, it's a valid point. Um, NTIA has talked about this for, well, since 2018. This has been a use case. It, um, it hasn't been, since 2018, it hasn't been discussed enough. Um, CIS is starting to talk about it a little bit, but it's more in side conversations rather than, you know, taking the full floor, as you know. Um, I don't know if they're going to take this up, honestly. Um, I mean, we can certainly postpone this, right? I'm not, you know, this is not something that we need to get into like right away. Um, it is something that they're talking about. Um, it is something that um, many software companies have a need to do. Um, right now, you can mark things as being incomplete. Uh, this is more as, this is more of a, well, it is incomplete, and this is why, because I'm redacting it, right? Um, so yeah, yeah I, mean, I, mean, I don't I know if this is gonna do anything about this. It might be another couple of years before something happens. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, and that's where I got. I, I'm very much wishy washy on it. Like on one side, I see what here. This is a small incremental change that begins to to meet that need, uh, and people right. have that immediate need. The other half of it is, is like, well, it's been, it's only been a week that this issue's been open. Like, do we have enough community within the OWASP recycling X community, not necessarily the greater community uh, feedback on it? It makes me kind of like, I don't know. I, that being said, I know a 1.7 is probably, I'll say light years out from, from the current uh, release that's on, on the horizon. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one seven will probably be at least a year. It might be a little bit longer because we're doing some pretty ambitious things with one seven. Let's put it that way. Matt? Yeah, I, admit, I haven't had a chance to look at this, so apologies. But what occurred to me was this might help me. Now, I don't have the use case you know, worked out to present internally to IBM, but it always comes back to me that there's always proprietary stuff when we produce our bills and materials and how do, can we leave, should we leave it out? Should we put it in? Should we leave it out? Should we put it in? 
And this gives us maybe a nice way to say, to say we locked it out and we intentionally redacted it in some way. So that's what my thinking is. Is that a, a valid use case? It Excuse is. Me. And that's the use case that ServiceNow has as well, because uh, we have this use case. Um, many others do as well. Um, and I mean, ServiceNow, for example, we don't have this because of national security. We we literally have contracts that prevent us from disclosing. And, and many other software companies have this same type of problem. So this is, this is, in my opinion, kind of a baby step. Uh, one of the other alternatives that I thought about doing with res respect to redaction is going down to the granular, you know, property, like, well, the name value has been redacted or the, the uh, supplier has been redacted, right? You could go down to that particular part. Uh, that would be another way to do that. But you could also combine these ways, right? You could say that this component has been redacted. And then in the future, you could say, well, here specifically are the things that, that I redacted. Well, so the question would be is that if, if you know, like maybe there's eventually be a, you know, leading to a, the, the eventual conclusion of that is, would we have a redacted bomb where I might create a bomb that scans everything? Then we have we selectively put create a redacted bomb and we we keep that held in proprietary some proprietary repository in IBM and we only produce the public one that we want people to see with a with a footprint an indicator saying we stuck took this stuff out and put it into a redacted bomb. I swear. That is a really interesting use case and if we included that with one six here or any release, I mean if we if we had this in the spec, then yeah you 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 would actually be able to have a redacted bomb. Because functionally, then it lets me, you know, maintain all the, the all the things we have in in Cyclone DX in terms of hashes and identifiers and concluded licenses and all those things like that. But it's you know the the the, the biggest thing that holds back people from producing public bombs is fear of exposing to their competitors that software which they hold proprietary and 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 differentiating themselves from their competitors. This yeah. would give me to to say we have that. And if we have to give it to you, government, we we have a means to keep it in a separate redacted SPOM and not throw it away. <laughs> and the way Cyclone DX works with BombLink, I mean, you could theoretically have different access control on your SBOM versus your redacted bomb because BombLink, right, you've got two separate things now. So if you wanted to be more public with one and and more restrictive with another, you theoretically could do that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, what usually happens in, in my last organization was um, developers were producing an overview about over a whole landscape of software that's driven by a web server, for example. The first thing that happened was that somebody from the security operations center stripped out versions of all web servers because this is information that must not be public <laughs> for, for stupid security concerns. I think now uh, it, my, my, my job was usually um, pretty easy. I didn't have to, um, to, to make sure that my S-bomb or my, my bomb was complete course it was redacted anyway <laughs> with that change damn i would have done so much work back then because then i could have to um but could have been in the position where i had to be sure to have a complete bomb and make sure the information that was redacted was just stripped out from 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 the perspective of somebody who produced that bomb i mean that's it's awful, <laughs> but um, from from the perspective of somebody who gets this bomb, this this would be great to to have the the other party in the situation where you can force them to make sure that the S bomb uh, that the bomb is complete and not just some information and you don't know what is missing or not. So this is a great a great feature, I guess, for for the consumers of bombs. Yeah, and, I, and to, to Ian's point, I think, you know, if CISA actually takes this on, I think there's room to expand upon this 
Um, so if we want to go down to the granular level, um, like I redacted this field, um, but not this field, for example, to grow with that, um, if if those types of use cases become required. Um, So uh, with that, is there uh, any further questions? Is there any objection to including this initial redaction support in the spec? So Steve, I, I'm going to voice my detract on, on this, but okay. um, I, my, I guess my follow-up question would be is, is there additional time to get the Cyclonex community and maybe go talk to Sissa a little bit I know it's going to jack things out, but like, is there time between now and a 1.6 release that we have just a little bit of more time to think about it? I like the approach. I like what I'm seeing. I'm just a little concerned about the aggressive time frame of getting it in. Yeah. Um, I don't believe so. Um, I, I can reach out to Alan. I know Alan is, is busy working on um, the end of life and the support stuff uh, from CISA. So I don't know how much uh, additional capacity that that CISA has to dedicate to to this. Um, I, I'll certainly follow up with him though. Uh, I got to follow up with him anyway to today on something else. Um, yeah, if, if it's not Alan, maybe I'm. And I apologize. I'm breaking on. I'm blanking on her name. Uh, not Kate, but the other woman who leads the Melissa that discussion. Melissa. Uh, getting that current input would be like a like a a great kind of compliment. I'll I'll reach out to Melissa. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll reach out to Melissa. So let's let's put this on the on hold for now, until we can uh, uh, get consensus on on moving forward with it. Sound good, Ian? Yeah, and uh, that could be next meeting. Uh, I, I'm not asking for a right. long deferral. Yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. hey, hey, Ian. A very quick question on that. Um, what what are we expecting to get as a feedback from CISA? Um, in, in my experience, those um, regulations are very like normative rather than, I guess, implementation detail oriented. Um, has it been the case in the past that I guess they gave like informal feedback on those kinds of things? So I think in this in this case, it's that uh, there are there are other people who are non CISA who who have been thinking about this subject. It'd be good to get a little bit of their their thoughts. Gotcha. I know Melissa is uh, yep. very versed in Cyclone DX. And, yep. You know, has been using quite a lot. So, um, and she's been thinking a lot about redaction. She's the one who's been kind of coercing the the community in a certain direction on redaction. So, uh, getting some of her feedback, I think, would be wise. Uh, just, just just considering that this has been only a week as an issue, and you know, as a PR. Yep. Um, no, I I, um, I I agree. It makes sense to ask additional. Uh, industry experts, etc. I was just wondering how that exact uh, scissor relationship would be, um, but, but that makes sense. Thank you. Very cool. I will reach out and uh, I'll loop you in as well, Ian. Thank uh, you, Steve. Yep, absolutely. All right, next issue. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, uh, concluded uh, value for the identity evidence. This is also, a, 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 I think it's a one line change. Um, right now we have, um, we have evidence and, um, this is the evidence of identity. So let's see, where's, where's the, um, no, oh, here it is right here. Um, so this is evidence of identity. So within Cyclone DX, you can have evidence. Um, and then within that evidence, you can have, well, here's all the, the methods and techniques that I that I use to identify a component. Each method uh, can have a, a value and a confidence. So, you know, I might be um, highly confident that it is, you know, this particular package URL, and I might have another method using a different form analysis that is lower confidence that it's this other package URL. What this is, is the aggregate, this is the decision of based on all the evidence that I've provided and the methods and the confidence, this is what I've concluded. This is what actually substantiates what I'm asserting as the identity of a component. 
So one line change, uh, the value of the fields, CD, Perl, et cetera, that has been concluded based on the aggregate of methods if available. This also, the, uh, um, I'm gonna use a military uh, phrase here, but the prey and spray, uh, where um, some requirements are to like overload a bomb with like 20 different CPEs, just because the NVD, the data in the National Vulnerability Database is erroneous um, a lot. So this allows us to also handle that particular use case where you just kind of overload things with a bunch of CPEs and here you go. Any questions on this one? Um, this seems like a pretty fundamental change as far as the tooling goes. Like the logic is pretty straightforward, right? We all get the point, yeah. but uh, um, tooling would have to stay on top of this. Um, this Am I seeing this correctly? Yeah, okay. There's and not a lot just... of tools. Yeah, that, there's not a lot of tools that support the evidence today. There's probably about a dozen or so, but yeah, you're right. Uh, they would have to, uh, to, to, this is not a required field, but they, right. they should, they, they should adopt this field. Uh, CDX Gen, uh, which is one of the more popular ones, I know that they're going to be uh, adopting this field, so. Okay, cool, yeah, I think that's the important part is that the, um, we do a little bit of PR for this to uh, make make sure the tooling's adopted too. And um, yeah, I guess the concern that I would have is it may introduce some ambiguity, like where to look for the pearl, as in, you know, if you don't have evidence is over here and if you have evidence is over there. Yeah. Um, so that's, that seems a little scary to me, actually. There's a brand new section in the authoritative guide to SBOM. So we're, we're actually working on the second edition of that. And cool. we're going to be launching the second edition along with the first edition of the authoritative guide to CBOM and the authoritative guide to attestations. So two new guides and one updated guide. Uh, the updated SBOM guide actually goes into that particular use case that you just described. Got it. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Uh, I think Matt was first. Yeah, I just want to echo Dennis is that I think that, you know, this is a, like a no-brainer and because this is the corollary to the license concluded license um the the thing is i to echo what dennis, dennis was saying is that so many you know it's the confusion um but you know not asking for that today work in that direction but be, the ability to move this up to closer to the component manifest level so that you know we can actually say because you know, a lot of people reduce their s bombs or a lot of scott, scott tools will not produce the depth of bombs that we want, but at least if we can say, give us a simple manifest and here's your concluded license, here's your concluded identity, it would, you know, disambiguate that for, for tools. And it makes, because people want to produce shrunken S bombs and just pass the manifest down with just what they need. This identity is essential. Identity is essential right. to every use case. Yep. John? Um, could you expand to example that we're currently seeing the JSON thing um, from from line 120 top could you could you click that that little arrow on the top to to expand the, the example a little bit uh, oh I didn't uh, know that was there <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> so we are now having a line 111 which competes against line 120 and as far as I stood if they are the same, then uh, no, they're not. Work. So this is um, no, they're not. So this is the uh, this is the this is what I am asserting. So this is the component itself. Mm -hmm. So I am asserting that the group is uh, com dot example. This is my evidence, and here I'm saying that the group I have concluded that it is com dot example because of this particular technique and that particular confidence. Okay, so I could have other concluded values and the one with the highest confidence could be the one that it's used in 111. Exactly, right? exactly. Ah, okay. That's so this, case. if you're an SEA vendor, if you're an SEA vendor, this is actually gonna be really, really important, especially for the binary analysis folks, which as we all kind of know the Technology of that is is more of an art than a science. Well, it's it's a science too, but obviously, but 
uh, the results are typically all over the place. And the confidence of different types of uh, techniques is really there. Yeah, if usually I've never missed that concluded value because I never was interested in do the evidence that was co collected because I actually only wanted to see the concluded actual value that was picked in and I'm on 111 and so. Right. So, yeah. but for, for people that are producing these things, it's probably great to, to write down the information they already had and store it in the document. Yeah. Yeah. It also allows, you know, for forensic type use cases as well. So, I mean, not all software is modern. Some software is 20 plus years old. So this will allow us to, you know, have all that evidence. Um, and then of course the concluded value is, is, is going to be part of that. Any other questions on this one? I got a thumbs up from Jan. Any other questions? Any objections on, on including this? Got a thumbs up from Keith. All right, I don't hear any objections. So let's, uh, let's see, let's go over here and uh, Okay. And last one. Um, so this is adding support for both Omnibor and Software Heritage IDs. Um, Software Heritage IDs are interesting. Uh, it's basically a way to um, um, archive for historical purposes software. Um, Omnibore is, 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 is more interesting to me, uh, especially from a vulnerability management perspective, because you can narrow down on a given artifact, uh, which I think is really interesting. Uh, we will be making one change to this. This will become an array because with Omnibore, uh, you can specify different hashing algorithms. So it's possible that an Omnibore will have both a SHA-1 and a SHA-256, for example, in the same artifact. So that minor implementation uh, change will be made today. Um, but other than that, um, the description is specifies the Omnibore artifact ID. The Omnibore, if specified, must be valid and conform to um, the provisional assignment from IANA, which is, which is there. And there is an example. This one uses SHA-1. Uh, obviously, if you change this to SHA-256, for example, then that hash is going to be longer. Uh, but that's the one use case where uh, an artifact could have multiples. Um, and then we got the same thing for software heritage IDs. So um, we are also including this in uh, the evidence. <clears throat> so in addition to being able to assert the identity uh, via Omnibore or soft software heritage, we'll also be able to... <clears throat> Uh, just like we did with the concluded value for the identity, we'll also now be able to say, well, this field, which is Omnibore, I've concluded that it is this Omnibore ID because I binary analyzed this particular artifact, right? And that's actually one of the use cases that Omnibore has where they're, they're actually stuffing Omnibore, uh, the, the gitoids into the artifacts themselves. And now you'll actually have a way to express, well, I perform binary analysis. I'm this confident on, on, on that kind of extraction. And then here is the value for that. Any questions on this last remaining? Um, also very interesting. I had never heard of this before. Um, may I just paraphrase this? This is, I guess, another identifier for artifacts, uh, a replacement or an alternative to pearls and CPEs. Yeah, it's it's an alternative to exactly. So obviously, CPEs got a lot of known issues, right? Pearl solves a lot of them, right? Um, but pearls also <clears throat> pearls also don't point to a specific artifact, right? Uh, that's the use case that Omnibore really solves is that you can narrow down the precise artifact that is, that is affected by right, something. Right. 
Um, and while that precision is great, it also will be um, it, it will become even more um, required, I guess, that you know a, a typical like NVD type of record or any kind of vulnerability database. You know, if we have like um, you know given CPEs or pearls, we might only have like twenty or thirty, but we might have in reality if vulnerability databases adopt Omnibore, they're going to really have to stuff in all of the potential Omnibore IDs because a given Perl could have technically multiple Omnibores. So your vulnerability database would kind of explode with data. But if precision is of utmost importance, an Omnibore is actually a really good identifier. And I know the folks at Cisco and, and others have been really pushing for this. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I'm not opposed to supporting that. Um, um, is Omnibor also organized under OWASP or? It is not. Is it is a? Um, is it under OSSF? I, I don't know. I know their Slack channel is under OSSF. I don't Got know it. if it's an OSSF project or not. Got it. Yeah, I think this is interesting. Um, I, I'm again. I'm not opposed to this. Um, this sounds like it's actually uh, serving a huge uh, value. Um. But at the same time, it's interesting because uh, I think a couple of weeks back, we have agreed to support or also include Perl itself in the standardization effort. So I wonder um, like where, where Omnibor falls in that in the sense of uh, should, we, should we engage with them more than just putting a field in the SBOM or, or not? And, um, mm. I, I don't have an answer to that. Um, just, I can certainly just, reach out. I know they've yeah. got a provisional thing with IANA. Uh, I wish it was finalized because I don't like putting provisional things in a specification. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, I can I can reach out to them. And, I'm, and not I'm, sure not, I'm not I'm not saying we should. I'm just um, generally like brainstorming, sharing what sharing yeah. what's on my mind. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. Cool. I think it is relevant just to, to answer on who and who, the, who these people are. Um, so Ava Black is one of the primary mm -hmm. maintainers. And they are the open source. Uh, what is it? Uh, what, what what's the title? Um, oh, it's CISA? CISA. I don't know. Uh, it's sheriff. Yeah, but they basically own uh, open source security at CISA, and they're one of the originators of this. And so is Frederick Klaus, who does a lot of work with CNCF. Ah, yeah. yeah, we can certainly approach them for the from the ECMA perspective for standardization. <clears throat> uh, Matt. Yeah, I, I I don't know anything about Omnibor. I'll just take what was said at face value. Um, I guess that it's still my belief system that package URL, you know, I'd like to see a side-by-side -side comparison of, of why, why this is better, what extra data it carries, because it's my belief system that if you have a a URI that's extensible through effectively query parameters, uh, whatever is missing could be added to package URL as well. So I'd hate to endorse another standard when package URL has such a growing footprint across open source, especially with signed packages and things, you know, being supported by SIGStore and things like that. So I'd, I'd like to make sure that package URL, as we discuss it here in this call, becomes robust enough so that we can't make those claims at Omnibor. I, I don't want to support another system. I have a full belief in package URL and there's so much investment now across the industry and open source to use package URL, including hugging face for, for uh, models. So anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I kind of agree. I'm, I'm a big supporter of package URL. I'm one of the maintainers of the spec. Um, so, you know, I, I think package URL solves you know, 90, 95% of all the use cases that we're going to need for identity and vulnerability management. Um, but it's not precise, which is, which is challenging. Um, I don't know what that means. So I won't ask today, but that's why when you say precise, I don't know what that means. Cause I can give you geolocation. I can give you variations. I can encode anything into a, a URI anyways. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. Um, yeah, it's kind of unfortunate. I mean, but the reality is, is that they already have a provisional thing with IANA. And um, the uh, CISA 
included Omnibor in their request for feedback for naming identification. So let the, the, let the government is looking flourish for. in like a field of flowers and compete with one another. But in, in my terms, I'm glad we're doing package URL here. So, yeah. I, I agree. I agree. Um, all right. With that, um, any objections, uh, blocking objections to including uh, both of these fields in 1.6? Uh, no, no objection. I just want to repeat that what Matt just said resonated with me very well. So, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. I agree. Okay. I have one addition. I think we should yeah. name that thing not Omnibor, but Omnibor ID. I tried to read onto the, the Omnibor universe today and I found out that they have several identifiers and everything has a name. But um, the thing that we were referring here is actually, I, I think it's the Omnibor ID. Yeah, it's the Omnibor artifact identifier, which is also called the Gitoid. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, then maybe in line 972, change it to something else. I, I have no idea what would be an appropriate name then. I mean, if All you right. name it, that's Git an Gitoid, detail people we can... would. Yeah, I see. Okay. Great. Then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's talk about that offline, Jan. Come on. All right, there we go. Um, because I can I need to make a few changes to that PR anyway. So um okay. Do we have oh we are at time already too, aren't we? Um, we had one more thing on our agenda, but yeah, we didn't get to it today. So we need to discuss um, the royalty-free patent policy. Uh, this was brought up, I think, during the last TC meeting. So during next TC's meeting, we will uh, we will lead off with that. Um, with that, let's so let's go ahead and conclude today's meeting. So thank you so much for attending. Thank you for your support. Uh, I think we made a lot of progress today. Ian, I'll follow up with you on uh, with Melissa, and um, uh, uh, Jan, I'll follow up with you on on the other things as well. So great meeting today, everyone. Appreciate all the support. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Steve. This is Simina. Maybe we can follow up later for some other issues that were on the chat. Okay. Thank you. All right. Oh, I didn't see the chat. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.